Introducing an all new channel, GG9 News, where we talk about all things happening in the NFL that don't get talked about on this channel in a completely relaxed, unscripted format. Newest video is up, where I talk about the Week 18 schedule and also talk about Dalvin Cook joining the Baltimore Ravens. So go check that out and subscribe. And now, on with our future presentation. I want to give you a hypothetical scenario. And again, I'm not sure if this is how it plays out. Heck, I don't have faith in my team to even win on Sunday, just because we've looked terribly as of late, and there's this two-decade-long streak that is against us, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. So don't mistake this for a prediction at all. Just go with me here. Let's say that on Sunday, that the Jacksonville Jaguars defeat the Tennessee Titans. They play extremely well, Trevor Lawrence looks good, the defense steps up, Josh Allen makes one last push for Defensive Player of the Year, Travis Etienne busts off a big run. You get the idea. The Jaguars finish this season at 10-7, tied with the Indianapolis Colts atop the division for first place. However, the Jaguars get a call from the league, and Roger Goodell says that, Hey, Jacksonville, you guys aren't winning the division. Indianapolis is the division champion based on the tiebreaker. You won the division last year, so it's only fair that Indy gets the chance to host a playoff game and make the postseason. A system like that would seem absolutely ridiculous, right? A system where you're punished for being too good. If you won the division recently, you can't win the division again if it's tied, so as to give other teams a chance to compete. Well, as absolutely ridiculous as that scenario might sound, and as ridiculously unfair as that scenario might seem, I kid you not, that's exactly what happened in the late 1960s. We've done quite a few videos this week on playoff scenarios and tiebreakers from the 60s, and you can learn more about one of the worst examples of the bunch, where a three-way coin flip determined the entire postseason by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And it only seems fitting to conclude this week-long series by talking about one of the dumbest scenarios ever, and a scenario that makes even less sense the longer you think about it. Because this is the story behind what has to be, considering the circumstances, the worst, stupidest, and most unfair tiebreaker in the history of the NFL. Before I talk about what exactly this tiebreaker was, we need some context to understand how the playoffs worked up until 1966, and what the other tiebreakers were that were in place. And for the most part, the footage that you're going to be watching throughout this video is going to be footage of divisional games that took place between 1967 and 1969, when this system was implemented. Just because that seems like the most logical way to do things, by showing footage of matchups where this was theoretically possible in. Prior to 1967, the playoff format in the NFL was simple. You had to win your conference in order to make the playoffs. It was first place or nothing. Having said that, there was plenty of room for leeway in the schedule. They were not bound by anything at all, seeing as the NFL Championship was a flexible date that was played at a home team stadium and not at a neutral site. What that meant was that if there was a two-way tie atop the conference, that a playoff game would be played between those two teams to determine who wins the conference. There were no tiebreakers. It was just like baseball back then, where if, after the conclusion of the regular season, you had the same record as another team, you would just play one extra game. The same thing applied if there was a three-way tie, or a four-way tie, or anything along those lines. And this happened quite a few times, with no issues whatsoever. You have this in 1965 in the Easter Conference, with the Green Bay Packers and the Baltimore Colts. You have this in 1957 in the Western Conference, with the Detroit Lions and the San Francisco 49ers and you have this in both the American Division and the National Division in 1950, just to name a few. Bottom line, the league didn't need a system of tiebreakers. But once 1967 rolled around, as in, the season you've been watching this whole time, everything changed for two reasons. Number one, instead of two teams making the playoffs guaranteed, you had four teams. It was still first place or nothing, but because the New Orleans Saints joined the league as an expansion team, and there were 16 teams, the league split into four divisions of four teams each, where each division winner would make the playoffs. 
But number two, and perhaps most importantly, the league was now bound by the Super Bowl. As in, the championship game between the American Football League winner and the National Football League winner. That game could not be moved. That was at a fixed site. And moving the game by pushing it back a week could be a significant disadvantage for the AFL team that could have quite a few weeks off. Plus, because it's at an neutral site, everything could get screwed up. If there was no Super Bowl and the NFL Championship was at the site of one of the teams playing in the game, then different story. But because of how everything was structured back then, extra playoff games and an extra week in the postseason was not going to cut it. Seeing as you already added an extra week to the playoff schedule by having four teams in there instead of two. Which raises the question. What happens if two teams are tied atop the division? Well, you need a series of tie breaks to figure things out. You need some way of breaking up the tie without having to play an extra game, while at the same time making this system as fair as possible. And folks, the system that they came up with was, yeah, anything but fair. The first tiebreaker was pretty standard, and it's the same one used today, which is head-to-head. -head. Every team played every other team within its division twice, once at home and once on the road. If you swept the series and went 2-0, you won the tiebreak. So far, so good. The second tiebreaker was also pretty standard, and followed what is used in soccer, which is aggregate. Across the two meetings, whichever team scored more points won the tiebreak. As an easy example, let's say that the Bears and Packers tie for first place in the division. In the first meeting, the Packers win 17-0, and in the second meeting, the Bears win 10-0. The Packers win the tiebreaker on aggregate, as they outscored the Bears 17-10 across the two meetings. Alright, so far so good. We've got head-to-head -head in aggregate. The league never actually said that head-to-head -head was a tiebreaker, but we can assume that this was the first tiebreaker, simply because if you swept the season series and won 2 nothing, you had to win on aggregate. That's how math works. But that raises the obvious question. What happens if you split the season series and the series is tied on aggregate? You might be thinking that this is an insane scenario, but off the top of my head, let's flash back from the present day or jump ahead in time to 2003, when the New England Patriots played the Buffalo Bills. Remember this? In Week 1, the Bills decimated the Patriots, as in what might have been the worst game of Tom Brady's career, the Bills won 31-0. Tom Brady threw four interceptions, finished the game with a passer rating of 22.5, which is worse than if he did nothing but spiked the ball into the ground on every single play, and got benched for Rohan Davey. But in Week 17, when the teams met in New England, the Patriots got their revenge, and this time, won 31-0, thanks to a great, way more characteristic performance by Brady, who threw four touchdown passes and no interceptions. The series was tied on aggregate 31-31. Obviously, the Patriots won the division that year with a 14-2 record, while the Bills were 6-10 in the final season for Greg Williams as the team's head coach. But what if the teams were tied in the standings? Who gets the tiebreaker? Well, that was easy. The team who gets the tiebreaker was whichever team had gone the longest without winning the division. Seriously. The tiebreaker wasn't divisional record, or total point differential, or total points scored, or anything along those lines. The tiebreaker was whichever team had the longest drought. If back in 1967, two teams were tied, and Team A hadn't won the division or conference since 1962, and Team B hadn't won since 1955, then Team B would be the team to win the tiebreaker. I kid you not, this was the system that they used back then. This was legitimately thought of as a good idea by some suits in the NFL, to determine a tiebreaker off of pity points. Whichever team had suffered the most was the one that would take the crown. Now obviously, there are many flaws with this system. In fact, everything about this system is a flaw. However, before we even dive into the ridiculousness that a system like this brings, we have to ask ourselves the obvious question. How did the NFL come up with something so stupid in the first place? What even gave them this idea? Well, my guess 
is that it has something to do with this scheme right here. The granddaddy of them all. The Rose Bowl. I talked a bit about this over on my college football channel, Jaguar Gator 8. So if you want to learn more about this, you can do so by clicking the card in the upper right corner. However, there was this thing called the no repeat rule, where up until 1972, the Big Ten did not send its conference champion to the Rose Bowl in back-to-back -back years. Michigan State won the Big Ten in 1965 with a 7-0 conference record, and represented the conference in the Rose Bowl that season. In 1966, Michigan State did it again, winning the Big Ten with a 7-0 conference record. However, because of the no repeat rule, Purdue, as in the second place team, ended up representing the conference in the game. It wouldn't shock me if the NFL drew some inspiration from that rule for their playoff system, designed the format after the biggest game in college football. However, at least for college football, it makes some sense. Even if it was the stupidest rule of all time, you can at least understand the logic, however dumb it was. You can talk about how playing postseason football in back-to-back -back years negatively impacts academics, or how it prevents these kids from being home with their families for the holidays, or how it gives other schools a chance to make money. Look, the rule was dumb, and I'm not going to pretend that it's not, but at least it made sense compared to an NFL playoff tiebreaker, especially at a time where there were no wild cards, so winning the division was the only way to make it. What are the problems with this rule for the NFL? Oh, where do I even begin? Number one, the goal of this rule is to allow new teams into the playoffs, but this system unfairly punishes the expansion teams. Let's look at a team like this team right here, the New Orleans Saints. Suppose the year is 1969, and the Saints are tied with the Cardinals for first place of a century division, and everything is tied on aggregate. The Saints enter the league in 1967, and have never made the playoffs, so unlike the Cardinals, they never had a season where they ended up playing playoff football. However, the Saints number for this would be a 3, seeing as they've been a team for 3 seasons, while the Cardinals number would be at 22, as they haven't won their conference or division since 1948. So the Cardinals would advance to the playoffs over this team right here, the Saints, simply by virtue of being older. For something completely out of control of the Saints, because they obviously can't control how old they are, they get completely screwed over. Number 2. Shouldn't the rule be in reverse? As stupid as the rule is, I would at least understand it if it was something like King of the Hill, where you have to be dethroned to lose your division crown. I would at least understand a system like the Ryder Cup, where tying isn't good enough. The team that lost the Ryder Cup, whether that be the United States or Europe, has to score more points to retake possession of the cup. If you want to be the best, you've got to beat the best. At least that would make some sense. This team was the best. You weren't better than that team this year, so they retained their crown. This system, on the other hand, punishes success. It actually punishes success. Which takes us to the next point. Number three. In a bizarre way, I kid you not, this system encourages tanking. Under this system, there are legitimately incentives to not make the playoffs, because it impacts your chances of success next year. It's almost like if there's a rule where the only teams that can make picks in the upcoming NFL draft are teams that miss the playoffs. If you're a fringe playoff team, and you've got some of the longest odds of winning the thing, do you want your team to make the playoffs and limp in at 9-8 and, and miss out on 10 draft picks potentially? Probably not. Think about it. Let's say under this system, you're in first place by a game, heading into the final week of the season. However, you've got a crappy draw. All of your playoff games, based on the way the rotational format worked, are guaranteed to be on the road. Seeing as all playoff sites were predetermined back then, it was yet another stupid rule. You know the other three teams in the playoffs, seeing as they already clinched the division, and you are in a completely different league compared to them. You went 0-3 in the regular season against those teams, and all four of those games were decided by four possessions, and you never led for a second in any one of them, and to make matters worse, your starting quarterback is now out for the season. If this was a normal playoff system, would you still want to make the playoffs if you were an owner or a fan? 
Of course you would! It's the playoffs! It's a huge accomplishment! And if you get into the dance, however slim your chances may be, you've got a shot to win it. But under this system, do you want to make the playoffs? Amazingly enough, no you don't! If you make the playoffs, it means that you are now the most recent team to win the division. And this means that next year, you're almost starting the season off on a one-game disadvantage. Almost like a points deduction in soccer. If you don't think you have a shot in the playoffs because you're outmatched, you don't want to make the playoffs because it negatively impacts your chances for next season. It's almost like if, let's say in Mario Kart, you could keep your items from race to race on the same circuit against your friends, and you have the blue shell. Why drop it in the race where you're super far behind and have no shot at winning? Save it for the next race when you have a chance. That's almost what this was like to some extent. Do you think the Washington football team and their fans really would have rooted for them to make the playoffs in 2020 when they were maybe the worst playoff team of all time if this system was in place or it would negatively impact their chances of making it in 2021? Probably not. Number four, you might be thinking that this is a super rare scenario and that this is something like me complaining about how today, technically, the playoffs can be decided by a coin flip. Even though you have to go through a bajillion tiebreakers and exhaust literally every stat in the book to get to that point. But amazingly enough, it's not. We saw that it happened in 2003, but even if we're just looking at times where this happened prior to the implementation of this in 1967, since obviously they didn't have the power to look into the future, there were times where the season series was split and tied on aggregate. I don't have the footage of this, so we're just staying with our divisional footage from 1967 to 69. But in 1963, the Pittsburgh Steelers tied the Philadelphia Eagles 21-21 in the first week of the season in Philadelphia. When the teams met in Pittsburgh in Week 12 three months later, the teams tied 2020. This means that if the Steelers and Eagles were tied in the standings, the aggregate split was 41-41 which obviously solves nothing. And that wasn't even that long ago. That was in 1963, and this rule was implemented after the 1966 season. So it's the same gap between now and the COVID season in 2020, just for some perspective. It's not like they forgot about this super rare instance from 1926 or something along those lines. No, this was a very real possibility. Number five. Even this tiebreaker might not be enough to decide it. You might think, okay, how hard can this possibly be? Just count the number of years, and the problem is solved. But this doesn't take into account divisional realignment, and we actually saw that from 1967 to 69, with these two teams playing against each other right here, the New York Giants and the New Orleans Saints. In 1967, the Giants were in the Century Division, while the Saints were in the Capital Division. In 1968, this flipped, with the Giants in the Capital Division and the Saints in the Century Division. And in 1969, this flipped once more, with the Giants in the Century Division and the Saints in the Capital Division. This was entirely by design. Now let's say that, hypothetically, in 1968, the Giants won the Capital Division and the Browns won the Century Division. In 1969, the Giants and Browns are both in the Century Division, and they finish with the same record and finish tied on aggregate. Who advances? Who gets the spot? They both won the division in 1968, so you can't even use that as a tiebreaker. So congratulations, NFL. You actually created a tiebreak system designed to break every tie, and didn't even break the tie due to a mess of your own doing. I could go on and on, but you get the idea. There are many reasons why this tiebreaker makes no sense at all, and might be, quite possibly, the dumbest way to decide anything. Now, as you might have been able to tell, based on the fact that this might be the first time you're ever hearing about this system, this never actually happened. From 1967 to 69, there were no ties for any division whatsoever atop the division, so you never had to implement any tiebreakers, let alone this wackadoo tiebreaker that we've talked about for the last 20 minutes. But still, just the fact that this was a realistic possibility 
and the fact that you could be determining a tie in the division by previous year's standings, especially because some of the players might not even been born yet based on how long the drought was, is absolutely ridiculous. Truly one of the stupidest systems I've seen. As a side note, in terms of the helmets behind me right here, they were arranged for a particular order, and it has to do with our story. If you think you might know the order and why they're arranged like that, let me know in the comments down below. This one's a bit tricky. Just to recap, the best idea that the NFL could come up with to break its high atop the division standings was to base it off of whichever team had the longest drought. Even though this meant that you're basing results from this season off of last season. Even though this, in a weird way, encouraged and incentivized teams to tank and not make the playoffs. Even though something like this was extremely common, especially back then when the two-point conversion, while it existed in the rival AFL, did not exist in the NFL, and there was no overtime. And even though this wouldn't even factor in the completely planned divisional realignment between certain teams, that was guaranteed to take place. I'm honestly not sure if this is better or worse than having it decided by a coin flip. I genuinely don't know. It's that stupid. Whatever the case, I highly doubt we're ever seeing the NFL ever implement another tiebreaker like this. Because from 1967 to 69, instead of the phrase being, if you ain't first, you're last, the phrase was more like, if you were first last year, you're last this year. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.